Hi everybody, Katie Reif here, senior writer for the AV Club, and this week A.A. A. Dowd is away at the Sundance Film Festival, so we've got a very special guest. Hi, Ignati. Hi, Katie. Ignati Vishnevetsky will be joining us for our discussion of the rhythm section. Welcome to Film Club. So yeah, the rhythm section, it's the third feature film from a director who's actually better known for doing TV. Her name is Reed Morano, and she's uh, best known for her work on The Handmaid's Tale. But here she's doing kind of a Luc Besson style, reluctant female assassin turns glamorous type of movie. And th it's also backed by uh, another well-known name in spy thrillers. Which is Eon Productions, yes. uh, Barbara Broccoli, Michael Wilson, I want to say. Now, you know this movie is based on a book because mm -hmm. it's called The Rhythm Section. And I feel like if this was like an original script for a Hollywood film, it would be called like Breach or something. And you couldn't <laughs> tell what it was about. And uh, even so, the title The Rhythm Section doesn't really give away. Well, a then, whole and lot. you know it, it has to be about spies because it's mm -hmm. got one of those like John Le Carre type titles, like mm -hmm. The Night Manager or The right, Little Drummer Girl. Right, right, right. I feel like there's a rule of thumb where if you see a book called, like, I don't know, The Stamp Collector or something, and it's not about a guy who collects stamps, it's about spies. Oh, I, I would like assume serial killers, but maybe also spies. Spies Usually also spies. Works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about, it's about something. It's just it's trying Something to hide sinister. and be as trying Secrets. to hide and be as inconspicuous as possible. Yes. And you're right. I mean, this is kind of a cheesy, trashy movie. Yeah that's trying to pass itself off as something I, somewhat classier. Yeah, I think it does have a certain element of self-seriousness to it, and a lot of it, I think, is in the style, the way it's shot. It's shot mm -hmm. like a gritty indie thriller in a lot of places, a lot of handheld. But really, you know, at its heart, it, there is the germ of a couple good ideas in this movie, but ultimately I felt they were squandered. For example, halfway through the film, I was kind of excited because I was like, Oh, an assassin who's not very good at her job, mm -hmm. who keeps fumbling her hits and realizes that, oh, like my fantasy here is not actually, this is not how it works at all, and I am not prepared for this at all. I thought that was an intriguing idea, but unfortunately, it just completely gets scrapped. Yeah, everything interesting it introduces into the plot, it just mm -hmm. kind of instantly lets go of mm -hmm. to be as... Well, as formulaic as possible. So you've mm -hmm. got Blake Lively yep. doing an English accent. What did you think of her English accent? I thought it was okay. Uh, yeah, I, I thought it was fine. Yeah. Nothing to get I upset feel like about. most of her performance is concentrated on keeping up the accent. Mm -hmm. It's not really a very interesting role. She plays a woman whose family died in a plane crash, and a freelance journalist finds her kind of down and out in London. Mm -hmm. Living on the street. Yeah, and somehow she gets wrapped up in all of this cloak and dagger stuff, and it kind of gets a mentor, and yeah. again, this is a very Luc Besson kind of thing. This gets a hunky mentor <laughs> in the form of Jude Law, who teaches her all about killing people. Right, in, in sort of a classic kung fu master kind of way where she says she wants to learn and he says Montages no. Montages of them her. running, you mm -hmm. know, she has to swim through a lake mm -hmm. and somehow becomes a cold-blooded killer and adopts the identity of an sort assassin of? who died. <laughs> the plot is kind of complicated for a movie that doesn't really have like a lot of twists to it. No, it's true. A lot happens, but there really aren't very many twists to it. There is one twist, but it barely counts as a twist because yeah. it's so obvious. <laughs> this film, as you were saying, it is a pretty standard plot, and so it's all about the style, which is pretty overwrought, I thought, yeah. especially in the needle drops. I know I'm not a Handmaid's Tale watcher. I don't need to, you know, we'll be living it soon enough. I don't need to watch it on TV. And uh, But apparently that show's also known for its needle drops. Maybe it's something that just works better in television, but there are just so many songs in here that don't seem to really fit the scene or the well, plot. But what about the the part where I'm waiting for the man? And she's the waiting. Ground, comes on as she's about to, <laughs> to score some heroin. <laughs> she's waiting for a man, I mean. <laughs> there is that, and then there's uh, Where Did You Sleep Last Night at the end. Yeah. It's, it, it reminds me of that cliche in movie trailers of a minor key slowed down version yeah. of a song to, you know, for instant drama. Uh, this film really relies on a lot of that kind of stuff. Although you were saying that there is one car chase scene that you thought was Pretty interesting. I, I think it kind of it looks interesting, mm -hmm. mostly because it's you know it's one of those fake single take car chases. Post children of yeah, men. That yeah, that everyone has tried to do since Children of Men. 
And you know, you can tell where all the cut points are because they're just constant whip pans between one thing and another, which I think is at least kind of, it has some novelty, mostly because mm -hmm. it's all sort of shot in longish lenses rather than these wide angles that everybody uses because they, they want everybody to know how much work went into this camera movement. Right. But then if you kind of get rid of the illusion of it, which isn't all that convincing, but like, you know, the digital stitching together, mm -hmm. it's like a sequence out of a born imitation from the, you know, late 2000s. Yeah, I think that's a statement that's pretty indicative of this movie in general, in that there are some surface appealing things about mm -hmm. it. Lake Lively, you know, known for her fashion sense, really wears the hell out of a lot of button ups in this film. And a lot of wigs. And a lot this, is a, of this is a wig, wig. movie. This is a wig movie. This is a hair dye movie, a wig movie. She changes her hair every couple seconds. And scenes. a lot of sweaters. But yes. the, shir the shirts, the shirts, yeah. But also sweaters. I feel like Jude Law just goes through. I don't know how this guy, who's like a survivalist ex spy, mm -hmm. living in a cottage in the middle of nowhere in Scotland, has so many impeccable, like sweaters in just impeccable condition. He looks like he's been styled for an ad. <laughs> Discipline, that's how. <laughs> but one character detail that I thought was just a, li a little too on the nose was uh, Lively's character, as we were saying, her family died in a car crash, or a plane crash, excuse mm -hmm. me. It sent her down this, you know, this spiral of despair that ended up with her, you know, being addicted to heroin and living on the street and all this. And so I think as a character detail, her character wears a lot of oversized clothing to cover mm -hmm. herself up, you know, maybe in response to, you know, being forced to do sex work to survive on the mm -hmm. street and all this stuff. But I thought it was kind of a ridiculous character detail that once she comes into her own as an assassin, she starts unbuttoning the top button. <laughs> that to me kind of sums up this film. <laughs> and I, I feel like among many problems in this mm -hmm. film is the fact that part of it hinges on the erotic tension between Blake Lively <laughs> and Sterling K. Brown, Which... a wonderful actor giving a weird, clammy performance. They have no screen chemistry no, together whatsoever. None whatsoever. There is a very flat love scene in he, this. He looks like he's her accountant and they're talking about her tax returns. You yes. Know? Yeah, oh, definitely. Or he's like, or she's like, you know, a, the daughter of a family friend who's staying at his house. <laughs> and it, and the, 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 there's a scene that kind of, it tries to pull off the, that out of sight move mm -hmm. where like, we're seeing the seduction and then we see them later in the bedroom. It's like the most unerotic thing, but then I feel like it's also sort of in the Luc Besson tradition, the really like awkward, uh, kind of off-putting sex scene. All right, everybody, and with that, we unbutton our collars on this edition of Film Club. Please be sure to join us again next week where we'll be talking about the rest of this year's Best Picture nominees at the Oscars. And in the meantime, please like and subscribe to the AV Club's YouTube channel. I'm Ignati Vishnevetsky. And I'm Katie Reif. We'll see you next time. Bye.